Venice is today an urban Disneyland, a place of remarkable beauty, but little economic dynamism beyond the tourist trade. The historic center of the city welcomed 2.6 million tourists in 2014, but housed only 60,000 permanent residents, less than one half of its population in either the 1960s or the 1600s. Yet the city's beauty reflects centuries of greatness. For 600 years, Venice was among the most prosperous places on the planet. The city's great wealth was produced primarily by trade, not conquest, although it would be a mistake to think of the Lion of Venice as a tame beast. Venetian commercial success also rested on perhaps the most effective urban government of the age, which could maintain internal order, deliver basic sanitary services, and fight wars with far mightier neighbors in order to defend the city's vital trade routes. The history of Venice begins in the chaotic centuries after the fall of the Western Roman Empire. The islands of the Venetian lagoon were defensible space, protected against marauding Goths and Lombards. Even the seaward approach to Venice is hazardous, and the Venetians would later protect themselves against naval assault by removing the markers that showed their own ships the safe path to the city. The Venetian community was supposedly started as a trading outpost of nearby Padua in 421. In 528, Cassiodorus wrote of the settlement's abundance of fish and its busy salt works. Venice's urban edge, safety from attack, became even more important when the Lombards conquered the Byzantine Empire's outpost on the Italian mainland, the Exarchate of Ravenna, in 751. The islands of the Venetian lagoon remained free from land-loving marauders, and refugees came to the last Italian outpost of the Roman Empire. The leaders of Venice, the doges, the word is a variant of the Latin dux or duke, were originally seen as representatives of the distant emperor in Constantinople. But by 803, Venice declared itself independent, enjoying its position as a free port, perfectly placed between the northern empire of Charlemagne and the eastern empire of Byzantium. Originally, the island's political core was on the barrier island of the Lido, now famous for its beach. But in 810, when the Franks captured that outer island, the Doge fled behind the barrier to the area near the Rialto Bridge, which is protected by water from the shore and protected by the Lido from the Adriatic Sea. Venice's physical geography, all those canals, delight millions of tourists. But initially, the central core seems to have been a set of marshy islands. The current city, is essentially man-made, held up by wooden poles, and connected by scores of bridges. Venice's long-run success reflected its extraordinary political institutions, probably the strongest in the world, which were capable of harnessing collective action for the common good, but also capable of stopping any one Venetian from establishing a dictatorship. This commercial city was no bastion of laissez-faire capitalism. Arguably, Venice needed such a strong state because its very geography needed to be transformed to be habitable, safe, and functional as a port. Even the earliest settlers of Venice seem to have put their houses on stilts to protect them from the water. Cassiodorus describes how Venetian homes lie like seabirds' nests, half on sea and half on land. The doge, Agnello Participazio, who led the defense against the Frankish attack of 810, set off a major building campaign on the inner islands. The Venetians built wooden bridges to connect the low-lying islands. They reinforced banks with sand to protect their settlement from the waves. And they drove vast numbers of poles into the water to provide firm support for their buildings. Santa Maria della Salute, built in 1630 to thank the Virgin for freeing the city from the plague, sits atop more than one million wooden poles. The city built to protect itself from the water, and it built to enable itself to cross the waves. The Venetian arsenal was a massive industrial complex dedicated, above all, to shipbuilding. It was a public, not a private enterprise. The state would build the ships and then auction them off. Groups of merchants would buy, not the galleys, but the right to use the galleys for a year. Central public production enabled the arsenal to operate on a grand scale and to reap the benefits of mass production six centuries before Henry Ford's cars were made in Detroit. The arsenal was a public enterprise, but the Venetian government operated neither like a modern democracy that tries to balance the needs of all its citizens nor like a medieval monarchy, fighting to advance the glory and power of the sovereign and the sovereign's house. The Venetian Republic was almost like a commercial enterprise wrapped up in the garments of statecraft. It was run by the lagoon's leading families, who were themselves almost entirely merchants, and it embarked on undertakings that would increase the wealth of that trading aristocracy. Did Venice's trading galleys need posts for resupplying themselves along the Adriatic? Did Venice's voracious appetite for wood, which was used both to build the city and to build its galley, need forests? Then the most serene republic would need to conquer outposts along the Dalmatian coast of the Adriatic Sea. 
Did Venice need a saintly protector who would watch over the ships and also attract the pilgrimage trade? Well, then the Doge would send merchants to steal the body of St. Mark that now lies in the center of the city's cathedral. The Doge's palace, a tourist highlight of the city, provides a physical tour of the political infrastructure that produced such a model of corporate governance. The palace is not the mansion of a prince, for Doges were elected officials who typically took office late in life, giving hope to us all, but the administrative hub of a mercantile empire. The palace contains a glorious Tintoretto portrait of notaries. Where else but in Venice would you see such a celebration of formal financial transactions? In the massive and magnificently decorated Chamber of the Great Council, all of the adult males of the city's leading families would assemble to pass laws and to elect the powerful Council of Ten. The chamber contains portraits of all the city's doges, except for Marin Fallier, whose space is empty. He tried to take down the Republic and bear the palm alone, but unlike Julius Caesar, he failed. The Venetian Republic's mercantile defenders were much stronger than the senators who wanted to preserve the older Roman Republic. The Rialto Bridge marks the center of the city's old harbor. Galleys would come to the Grand Canal and unload the riches of the East, spice and silk, gems and glass, brought from Egypt and Constantinople. But some of Venice's Byzantine relics were taken by conquest rather than earned through trade. When Venice sold its services to the soldiers of the Fourth Crusade, it first demanded military support, help capturing the city of Zara to provide another trading outpost for the Republic. The Pope excommunicated Venice for turning a crusade into an attack on a Christian city. The Republic regularly shrugged off such displays of papal peak. Even more importantly, the Venetians and Crusaders later repeated this trick by capturing Constantinople itself. The horses of the Basilica of San Marco were stolen from Constantinople's ancient hippodrome. Byzantium's skilled glass workers were brought back to Venice and formed the nucleus of the city's remarkable glass industry that persists to this day, supplying jewelry and knickknacks for tourists from all over the world. Later, scholarly refugees from Constantinople would provide the texts for Aldus Minucius, whose Aldine press would turn Venice into Europe's printing powerhouse. Trade and warfare were never far apart during the Middle Ages. Venice fought bitter wars with Genoa during the 14th century over access to the markets of the East. Venice encouraged the Ottomans to snuff out Portuguese explorers who had the temerity to round the tip of Africa and obtain direct access to the spice markets of the East. Venice played an important role in the 1571 Battle of Lepanto, which stopped Ottoman expansion in the Mediterranean. The Mediterranean Sea was the highway of Venetian commerce, and the Republic was always willing to fight to ensure that its galleys could cross the sea's waters. As a Mediterranean power, Venice steadily lost importance as commerce became global. Atlantic powers like Holland and England ultimately became more important mercantile powers during the more globalized 17th century. Venice's independence was snuffed out by Napoleon in 1797, but by then the glory years of the Most Serene Republic were long gone. Yet Venice remains a place of spectacular beauty, built not by kings, but by extremely successful merchants. It is a city of commerce, but one that reminds us that commerce, like successful cities, often rests on the strength of strong political institutions.